you know, always be looking. If you're on vacation, have a look at the market. I think it's human nature for real estate investors to always be looking at the real estate market wherever they happen to go. Probably almost too much. But, you know, part of how we spend our vacations is we're kind of always looking to see what the market looks like wherever we happen to be. You found the Real Estate Law Podcast. Because real estate is more than just pretty pictures and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. If you're a real estate professional or looking to build real estate expertise, then welcome to the conversation and discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. It's the Real Estate Law Podcast, and this is Jason Muth, and I'm here again with Rory Gill, attorney broker from Next Home Title Town Real Estate in Boston and Urban Village Legal, also serving Massachusetts and New Hampshire. It's good to be back. Hi, Jason. Uh, you know, this is actually part two of two part conversation that we're having all about how to evaluate a vacation rental market. If you stumble into this episode and have not listened to part one just yet, uh, we encourage you to go back and listen to part one. Uh, just to get a couple, uh, get caught up on uh, a longer discussion about the points that we're going to breeze through before we get into the next few things that you should talk about for vacation rentals. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see that we're still wearing the same dad shirts from the previous episode. It's not because we didn't do laundry or just wear the same clothing over and over. We're just recording this back to back. You know, we should have switched shirts, but that would have been fun. We are in one of our vacation rentals that we own. We are at a lake in uh, New Hampshire. The reason that we're here actually recording over an extended 4th of July week, and we're probably going to release this episode in, uh, later on this summer, is actually because we had a cancellation over 4th of July week. And uh, we decided just to come ourselves uh, instead of rebook it. And I can guarantee, guarantee 100% if I were to put this back on the market, the second I got the cancellation and increased the rates by 10% or so, it would have gone immediately. I mean, that's how crazy the rentals have been this year. But we were kind of planning on coming up for a couple of days before and after this trip. And instead, we just decided to come up for the entire duration because um, – the rental market has been on fire this year, the short-term rental market, and our places are doing great. Our projections are way ahead of schedule. And we said, hey, why don't we use it? So mm -hmm. we're here, right? We're here and we're thinking about vacations on our minds. So we're going to continue our conversation. But if you missed the first one, we had some really good points about seasonality and how to contend with seasonality in a rental market. And then uh, we discussed Airbnb uh, short-term rental regulations. Those are must-knows if you're looking at uh, vacation rentals. But that the conversation doesn't end there. We have a lot more tips that we can share about um, evaluating and picking it a short-term rental market. I'm going to throw one in there that you didn't even like prepare. And it's going to be just a really quick one. But, you know, always be looking. If you're on vacation, have a look at the market. I think it's human nature for real estate investors to always be looking at the real estate market wherever they happen to go. Probably almost too much. But, you know, part of how we spend our vacations is we're kind of always looking to see what the market looks like wherever we happen to be. And this, this trip has been no exception to that. And if you're listening to this, uh, maybe you're listening on the way to vacation or maybe you're listening to it while you're on vacation. But you know you've done that, right? If you're, if you're a real estate investor, if you're listening to our podcast, all the real estate podcasts out there, Bigger Pockets podcasts, Bigger Pockets, but whatever, like we listen to all these podcasts and, you know, we're driving to long distances. We'll listen to podcasts, you know, episode, episode, episode. So like you're in that mindset, you're in that real estate mindset. And when you're on vacation, you're saying, geez, I wonder if I could afford that. And short-term rentals and the platforms that have come out in the past decade, uh, Airbnb and Verbo are the two that we use, they've really made it possible for people to become self-managed vacation owners if they choose to do that. You could obviously go through uh, any of the great property managers that are out there. They will you know, significantly cut into your profits, but they will make it a lot more turnkey. And, and you're doing your numbers if you're going to factor in a property manager and you're, you don't want to deal with the, you know, the guests or anything in any communication whatsoever, you know, factor in 25, 40% on top of uh, your expenses. And, and maybe the numbers will still work for you. But, you know, always be looking for property. And, and that kind of will dovetail into some of the things that you should be really evaluating if you're going to be looking for a real estate investment in a, in a vacation market for short-term rentals. And the next one that's on our list is to have a backup plan. There should be a plan A, B, and C 
whenever mm-hmm. you're going to have real estate investment. Rory, tell us a little bit about some backup planned ideas and why right. you want so, to do this. So we talked about the just the rules and regulations that you want to be looking at when you're considering um, in a short-term rental property, but those regulations change and change in the market can change too. So you want to know how well the property would perform if you set it up another way. So how would it perform as a long-term rental? What it would look like, what would it look like if you had to sell the property to somebody for them, for whom it would not be a vacation rental or a vacation property. So how does this property stack up otherwise? So you'll end up with these um, kind of hybrid markets where where they could also be used for long-term residence, but also for um, a vacation property. Those are strong ones because then you have a solid backup plan if the, the vacation rental doesn't work out either for you or there's a, there's a market-wide problem. Um, and this is especially true for markets where there's one core attraction that you're dependent on. If you are there because of one particular ski area or one particular amusement park, if that were to close down, that would decimate the the short-term rental market there. I can think back to my childhood. I used to go skiing at least once a year in a mountain in Vermont called the Scutney. And there were some independently owned hotels and timeshares at the base of the mountain. But unfortunately for them, the mountain ended up closing down permanently. They stripped the chairlifts away, sold them to other areas. I've heard that the main lodge has since burned down. And that, you know, those those properties whose prime um, reason for being was that they were at the base of a mountain. You could, you could just, you know, ski directly from the mountain to your own condo. That went away overnight. And those, you know, so if you were a short-term owner of one of those or a vacation owner of one of those properties, now what would it look like? What's the underlying market? What would that, how would that work as a long-term rental? Uh, Would it lose half of its value overnight? Uh, Would you be supporting mortgage that you have no means to pay for? Know the backup plan and know that things change. Either your business plan has a a flaw in it or the market has a flaw in it. Mm -hmm. So the backup plan that we have, for example, here in New Hampshire is what we like about this lake is that it's a community of people, some of whom live here year round and Mm -hmm. many of whom are second homeowners. And a lot of those second homeowners, they either will rent on, you know, word of mouth or just, you know, to friends and family, or they'll use them themselves. So it's an interesting mix of folks around here. And I'm sure that other lakes are, um, are also very similar to this. In that, uh, you know, there's actual, there's, there's a town, there's a small downtown, there's a school system, there's municipal resources, and there's a mixture of people who live here and take advantage of those year round, and some folks that come from Mass or, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, wherever else people are, are coming from, and they utilize their houses on a part-time basis and they rent them otherwise. So, you know, it's got a bit of a flair for rentals like people are used to seeing folks here that are visiting people are used to seeing their neighbors as well if they live here year round and the the house that we chose could easily be a year round home for a family and we could rent it out to people long term Mm -hmm. we could live here if we need to i mean like that's kind of how we've planned this out And, you know, some of it was probably given, we probably gave some thought to this before we bought it, but we also probably lucked our way into it, just meeting that criteria to the point that we could now say, hey, if you're looking at a short-term rental, make sure it checks a couple of those boxes as a backup plan. You know, we've always said that our extreme backup plan was we could move here if we needed to, right? Like Mm -hmm. we could just pick up and live here full time. Like it's a great community. I don't think I'd want to live here year round, but we could, if there was financial ruin, if we had to just pick up and leave uh, Boston and live somewhere, we'd have shelter, we'd have bills paid for, and it would work out. And we, we kind of did that a little bit last year <laughs> during the beginning mm-hmm. of COVID. So we did kind of pick up and, and live here for a longer period of time when it wasn't rented. And it was fine. It was totally comfortable and, and we could do it again if we needed to, and hopefully we'll never have to. But whereas the other place we have in the Cape, like right now, like we're, we're working on, we have, we have two vacation rentals. Like I wouldn't live there year round. No offense to Provincetown, but our specific unit is good for short rentals. You know, mm-hmm. you're there for a weekend, you're there for a week, you're there for a month. It's great, great location, great vibe, but like, it's not like a year round 365 day rental. I don't think it is. I don't, I don't really have that backup plan with that one, but you know, people should be thinking about you know, what happens if they change 
the short-term rental regulations? Uh, can I sell the place? What happens if that primary attraction, as you mentioned with the Scutney, you know, is closed? Like, what do I do with this place? So think about that. Like, you know, and you might come to finding an amazing home that just doesn't check those boxes and doesn't have a good plan B and C. And you might want to move on from it. And you should, because there's always going to be another place. Mm -hmm. so don't force it. Don't make it happen if, if it's not there. Let me also ask you this question, Rory. Lenders, okay? So lenders are still catching up with short-term rentals. They're not there yet. They're not all fully there yet. You have found some, some lenders that actually specialize in it, but, but the most lenders, like community banks, you know, large national banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, that kind of thing. Like they're going to look at, if you want to do a short-term rental, like they're going to try to figure out if, if there's another plan because they want their money and they want to make sure you can pay your mortgage, right? So even the lenders that specialize in uh, short-term rentals will want to know what the backup plan is, as they should. So they will take a look at what, you, what your expected cash flow would be as a short-term rental, but they will... Similarly, they'll want to know what the cash flow projections would be for a long-term rental because they have the same concerns about regulatory change or just about market change or if just you bad at running a short-term rental property, they want to understand what the, the backup plan is. And then the other lenders won't even look at what the short-term rental projections are at all. In fact, many lenders will actually want the property place and service as a long-term rental um, for the first year. So lenders are a little all over the place with this and lenders don't favor the short-term rentals because they're still catching up. But even the ones that know the space the best are also looking for the backup plan. One thing I would encourage you to do if you're listening to this and you're trying to figure out how to finance a short-term rental is don't give up on just the one lender you've reached out to or someone you know with whom you already have a relationship because there's all different types of lenders that are out there. There's national banks, there's community banks, there's credit unions. There's people that are specializing in this space right now. There are ways to get it done. Like if you need to get it financed and you're getting a no from the first five people you talk to, you might have to just keep pushing forward and finding a different type of lender that's going to finance the project in the way that you, you know, want to get it done. Not that we had an issue in Provincetown, but I do want to give props and a shout out to uh, our lender down there, our local bank, uh, which is Siemens Bank. And they're right there in Provincetown. They're in Truro. They're based on the Cape. And, you know, we initially had an issue with, uh, you know, with the, the first lender that we were working with. And we were a little bit further down the line. They realized that uh, there was something in the condo docs that, you know, precluded them from being able to... Uh, what was it resell it on the, on the, on the market or something like that. So they actually had to withdraw from being able to lend to the property, but we scrambled and found a local bank that, you know, not only was able to do it, but they kept it, I believe as a portfolio loan because they're used to, they're used to properties being utilized in the manner in which we were utilizing it. Oh yeah, we got this. We know the market, like, you know, mm -hmm. come finance through us. Uh, and we did, and we refinanced it through them as well because we've had such a great experience with them. So, you know, shop around, you'll find a lender that, you know, can, can work with you. It might be different terms, right? It might be different it, interest rates. You may have a higher rate. You may have a reserve requirement. You may have things that you're not used to with conventional lending, but you'll find something. And if you're really stuck, just take a look around and see who's lended to the other people who are similarly situated. So if you see all these Airbnb properties around, somebody's lent, uh, lent to them, mm -hmm. you know, go look up your registry of deeds and see who holds the mortgage. That will give you some direction and, and as to where to go. And if you don't know how to do that, you could reach out to Rory. He certainly is on lots of towns' websites, logging in and figuring out who knows uh, who owns what and who owes what and who holds the different loans. Another thing you could do is you could research the forums on uh, Bigger Pockets or on Facebook. You could join local Facebook communities that have people that either live in that town or are second homeowners in that town. Um, you know, Facebook groups is actively advertising uh, and they have been for quite some time now. And there's a lot of chatter on Facebook. And I, I certainly get a lot of information out of there, whether it's contractors or lending opportunities. But, you know, in Provincetown, there's a second homeowners group, for example. Like I joined it. And, you know, if I need to do a keyword search on topics that have been discussed for the past couple of years about a lender, I bet you I'd find something. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would strongly encourage you guys to do that. It's the power of user generated content and the power of groups. Okay, onward. Oh, I'm sorry, you have something else there? No, I wanted to move no. on to our next, next point here. 
You know, you have to give me a sign because I'll just keep on going. Like, I'll just you, keep talking. I think it's the power of the pink microphone I have right now, right? All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Onward, how to evaluate a vacation. Randall Mark is what we're talking about. Rory, what's the next, uh, next item on your list? So my next advice for people researching uh, rental markets or vacation rental markets is to also research the hotel market. Those hotels, they are your competitors. Um, so you want to understand... Um, uh, how the hotel, what the hotel scene looks like in the area. Are there a lot of hotels with a lot of vacancy? Are there a limited number of hotels? Are the hotels that exist, are they gross? Are they um, nice? What kind of amenities do they offer? Really take a look around and understand those because the ho those hotels are going to be competitors to you and they're going to create also a price competition too. So if you have dreams of pricing your property really high, um, the hotels, will, if they have a lower rate, are going to have a downward force on that. And that's particularly true for the slower season. So during the times of year where your guests may stay a, sh a smaller number of nights, well, now the hotels are more direct competitors. For weekly rentals, it's going to be a little bit different because people who stay a little bit longer uh, welcome the amenities of a home. But for those weekenders, those hotels are a direct competitor um, to, to your business plan. So understand what the hotel market looks like. And that, thanks to all the different hotel shopping websites, is a fairly easy thing to do. Take a look around and see who, what hotels are in the immediate radius around you. Great. I have a lot to add right there. So let's talk about the hotels, first of all. So here in New Hampshire, where we are, there's a couple of hotels nearby, not a ton. Uh, like there's a brand new Holiday Inn Express or what have you, like along the main roads. You know, mm -hmm. these those hotels are often in places that are heavily trafficked, where they have a nice campus, um, uh, nice properties. Maybe it's if it's new, it's clean, right? I'll, I've said it for decades when I used to travel for my job, I would much rather stay in a brand new Courtyard Marriott than an older, tired uh, you know, Marriott that used to be the primary hotel back in the 80s in a downtown area. Uh, even though the Courtyard's amenities were more limited, they were brand new, it was cleaner, right? So like, you know, there's there's that. If it's a new hotel, it's gonna be clean. We've stayed in some great like suites-based hotels that mm -hmm. are, you know, easy to find. You can book them that same day. They give you free breakfast, you know, powerful Wi-Fi, plenty of places to park. And there's a benefit to doing that. But, you know, you might not want to be there for a week. You know, you, you just mentioned it right there. Like you might want to spread out a little bit more if you're there for a week. Um, you know, there's only so much you could do with one room that's going to be through 250, 300 square feet with two queen beds in it. And, you know, it's, it's, if you, if you have kids, you know, I'm, I bet you you're going to drive each other nuts after like, you know, day five of doing that. So th that's why I think vacation homes, uh, vacation rentals, short-term rentals have become really popular is that people can have the amenities of being at home, being within a community and having more space to stretch out. So, but to your point, those are direct competitors because somebody could easily just book it that night. Remember, those places are also paying uh, the same taxes that you're paying. So take a look at the room rental. Realize that you're on evil, even playing field with room rental. You're on even playing field with, with your taxes. But where you're at a disadvantage as a short-term rental operator is that you're often charging a cleaning fee on top, which you should be doing. If you're not doing it, you should do what people are used to it. Um, you could choose as an operator to subsidize the cleaning fee to try to get more bookings. We do that in one of our places where I actually uh, charge less than I pay out because I think it helps the bookings and it certainly did it this year. But, you know, they're not going to charge a cleaning fee. It's going to be baked in to their nightly mm -hmm. rate. All right. So, like, it's going to feel like you know, that's not apples to apples. The second thing is not apples to apples are the platform fees. So, you know, Airbnb, Verbo, they charge, they, they make money by creating the market. So they're going to make money from the renter and they're going to make money from the uh, landlord, the people that are posting on the property. So you might get, you know, a $200 a night, $300 a night uh, property that you find on Airbnb and after taxes, cleaning fee, booking fees, you know, you're spending 400 a night. I mean, it's not, or more, that is not uncommon at all. And that's where people are going to start to like say, whoa, that's this is such a rip off. Like, look at these people, like, you know, all these additional fees. It's not us. It's the platforms. Like that's the marketplace. But hotels have an advantage because they're really baking that into their nightly rate. So just, yeah. just realize that. Hotels though, you know, if you're there for a couple days and you're there for a wedding, 
Maybe you're all staying at the hotel. Maybe they have a great bar downstairs. You could have lots of drinks after the wedding. And then the next day when you wake up, you all recount the evening and you're all together. Like that's a very common situation for weddings. Think about the wedding crowd. Um, if it's a destination wedding and you're in a beautiful setting, like in New Hampshire or on the Cape or something, you know, a lot of people that are directly tied to the wedding might want to stay there. But we get bookings all the time for people, at least in New Hampshire we do, people who are coming for a local wedding and they just all want to stay together as a family. Like So mm -hmm. like maybe eight people want to stay together. There's a lot of siblings or there's two families. They want to stay here instead of staying in that same hotel. Maybe there was no room block. Maybe they're the only people that are coming from out of town for that wedding and they might choose to stay in a vacation rental instead. That's where we could come in as, as operators for short-term rentals and really help out and offer something that's very different from the efficiency hotels. And think about what you offer that's different. Because if you could yeah. offer a different experience, people are definitely you know, going to evaluate that when they're looking to book a hotel or you. Understand, yeah. Understand, though, what the hotel situation is. This, Especially if you have a home that has um, a smaller capacity. Um, and as I talked about in the last podcast, the... Um, there's a lot of value to the shoulder season. So the shorter stays the sh with the smaller groups, the hotels are going to be a direct competitor to you. Right. In the busy season, you know, now shifting over into Provincetown, for example, or anywhere on the Cape, like you're going to have a mixture of, you know, regular uh, bed and breakfast hotels and short-term vacation operators. And yeah, like in Provincetown, all the bed and breakfast and hotels operate out of there, those are competitors of ours. Like absolutely, because people could just book a place there and not worry about the cleaning fees, get it cleaned every single night. You know, we're not going to offer nightly cleaning in our um, vacation rentals. Like if you're going to be here for a week, you pay one cleaning fee, it happens at the, it's clean when you show up, but then you're also playing, you know, you're, you're paying for the next person's cleaning basically, or you're paying for your cleaning really is, is the way I like to say it. Like you're paying to have the place fully clean, but like in a bed and breakfast, they're probably going to come in there every, you know, every day, make the room down, you know, make the room up mm -hmm. and clean the bathroom. Uh, they might offer free breakfast. So you might want to do that too. In your short-term rental, you might want to make sure you have a good selection of coffee Maybe you have some, you know, options for breakfast. We don't supply breakfast here because we have a full kitchen and people tend to bring their own groceries, but we do supply coffee because um, people that drink coffee, they want coffee first thing in the morning. So mm -hmm. as long as there's something here, it checks that box off. And, you know, there might be some other amenities that the hotels provide that you can't provide, like a, uh, a gym or a pool or beachfront access. I mean, those are all things that might differentiate those properties from you. So when you're taking a look at your hotel competition, keep all that in mind that there might be other amenities and that's why they charge the rates that they do. But you know, it's a lot of trial and error. There's some great software online that will allow you to determine rates in relation to other short-term rentals like AirDNA and, and tons of other websites. I don't know if they factor in hotels on top of that. Um, but what I will say is you should also factor in what the other short-term rental operators are doing in your marketplace. It's not just the hotels that are your competition. It's like-kind properties that other people are looking at. Because think about the booker or, or the, the renter. They're evaluating properties on a map. They're scrolling around the map. They're saying, I want to be in this zip code or near here. It can be places that are 10 miles from there. This is a whole different topic. Not going to get too deep into it. But like, if you could find other properties that are within a short radius of, of where you are, and they're very similar. They're also three bedroom, two bath places. They're also one bed, one bath places. Look at them. Look at how they market themselves. Look at the prices that they have. Make sure that they've been doing it for a while and they're not a brand new operator because you don't want to base all of your decisions on someone else that's also basing decisions on new information. Mm -hmm. You want to try to find someone that's been doing it for a while. And like our place would be a great, I shouldn't say it, but you know, whatever. This is information's information. Our place would be a great one for people that are in this area to to research and see what we're doing. And you know, I can't hide people from doing that, so I might as well say it. Uh, you know, I think we'd be great research for someone that wants to do this in this area. Um, but look at your competition and see uh, how you're different. See how they're pricing. Uh, see their reviews and 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 base your info on that because you know the more information you have the more successful you're going to be as an operator. So hotels, other short-term operators nearby, those are all valuable data points for you. So I have one last point when you're evaluating uh, vacation rental markets, and that is just to not rule out the less popular places. Yeah. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, the 
Remember how supply and demand works overall as a concept and vacation rental markets work the same way. Those really heavily in-demand locations are pretty obvious. They're the ones that are on the beach, at the mountain, on the lake, um, at a place where there's a particular draw. Those places are pretty obvious and those places do have a lot of demand. Um, but people still travel for family reunions, weddings, special occasions, everywhere in the country. Um, so places that are not, you know, famous vacation destinations still have some inbound travel. And if you did this level of research uh, to those places too, you'll often find that a lot of these places are really underserved with other short-term rentals and hotels. So if you can find one of those markets, even though it's not one of those hot in-demand places, you can set the market because there are no other places for people to stay. I've gone to weddings before in more rural parts of the country where they're just, are, they're, they don't have the hotel infrastructure for you. You can't find a place to stay. And often you can't even find an Airbnb to stay. So if you were the one Airbnb on there, you are still, you know, while the demand is relatively low, the supply is super low. So you, you're in a good spot there. So don't rule out those places that don't jump out to you as vacation destinations. Still apply all the same tips and factors that we discussed um, in these two podcasts. But don't ignore and rule out those those secondary markets uh, right away. And uh, if you've made it this far in the podcast, uh, we appreciate your listening. Uh, but make sure you listen to the first part of this as well, because we talk a lot about what you need to do with restrictions and HOA and taxes, and you know what local municipalities, uh, you know the types of laws they're passing, and how you should really research that, and really how to plan for properties that perform throughout the year, not just in the most extreme, you know, high demand season. So those are also great tips that, you know, hopefully will factor into uh, your decision to evaluate or to, to buy a property or to evaluate a vacation rental market. Uh, and there's just hosts and hosts. I mean, this is an ongoing topic. It's one of the more popular topics in, in the bigger pockets forums. There's so much information about this right now. Um, and if you think about some macro trends, I'm certainly not an economist. Take this as, you know, my opinion and entertainment, but advice. I think, I think I'm not stupid, right? Hopefully I'm not. I would say that the population is growing. We just came out of, or coming out of a pandemic where short-term rentals saw an extreme drop in mm -hmm. use, followed by an extreme lift where there is not enough supply to deal with the amount of people that want to travel. So I really think that in the past 12, 12 15 months, we have seen those two extremes. Like we've seen it shut off entirely and now we've seen it going bonkers. The truth is somewhere in between, okay? It's not gonna be one of those two things, but we've seen what's gonna happen if everything shuts down. We've, we're seeing what's gonna happen now if everyone's traveling again. And like, you know, vacation rental prices right now are through the roof. I keep saying if I had more, if I had three or four more properties right now in the same locations where we are, they would be full. Whenever we got um, a booking that canceled, I think I've had three or four cancellations over the past few months, like where, you know, health issue, travel changed, whatever. Every single time, with the exception of where we're sitting right now, which is because of a cancellation, we chose to come here ourselves for a holiday weekend in the summer, for the July weekend. Every single situation, I raised the prices. And every single situation, it rented within 48 hours. Like every time, like we are in extreme uh, high demand part for short term rentals. What's going to happen next year? I don't know. I mean, like right now, the border with Canada is still closed. Okay. Travel is coming back. Like people are flying places. I don't know if they're going to Europe as much as they were, but a lot of folks here in the US, they are traveling, driving destinations whenever possible. Like they did it a little bit last year. They're doing it again this year. That might change, you know, and it might change if you're a flyaway market like Las Vegas or Hawaii. You know, maybe you'll see, um, you know, huge demand in the coming years. Uh, driving markets are doing great right now. So research the macro trends as well. Uh, realize that it's not just local, but it could be just an overall um, you know, economic uh, trend that you're seeing that will probably factor into your decision. Ask around, listen to podcasts like this, do your research, talk to attorneys. There's just, I mean, there's an endless amount of information uh, and questions. And actually beyond all that, just act. Like don't do, just don't, don't research, research, research to the point that you're not gonna do something. 
if your gut tells you to do it, do it. I'm done. All right. <laughs> Thanks again, Rory. I appreciate uh, your putting all this together and your time on this podcast. Uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you with questions? I'm easy to find. I'm at urbanvillagelegal.com or you can find me and my real estate team at nexthometitletown.com. And you can find me at jason at nexthometitletown.com. Uh, you can find us on Instagram pretty easily. We're on Facebook as well. Uh, and the Real Estate Law Podcast is looking for guests. Uh, we will be inviting guests on the podcast later on this summer. If you're interested in, in guesting on the podcast, it could be about any topic related to real estate, real estate law. It doesn't have to be short-term rentals. Please reach out to one of us. We'll get you set up with an interview and we'll get the podcast recorded and release it uh, a few weeks after that. So until next time, thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate it. And Rory and I, we're going to get rid of our dad shirts and go out on the lake, right? Yep. Well, let's do that. And when you see us, vacation will be over. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. This has been the Real Estate Law Podcast. Because real estate is more than just pretty pictures. And law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. We're powered by Next Home Title Town, Greater Boston's progressive real estate brokerage. More at nexthometitletown.com and Urban Village Legal, Massachusetts Real Estate Council, serving savvy property owners, lenders, and investors. More at urbanvillagelegal.com. Today's conversation was not legal advice, but we hope you found it entertaining and informative. Discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Thank you for listening.